yeah, thanks very much. Thanks to everyone who's uh, linked in today. My name's Roy Beely. I, I studied as a fishery scientist at Rhodes University in South Africa. Uh, during that time, I did a bit of work in Angola. And thereafter, I've been in Kenya, Australia, ran a project in the Caribbean for the UN, well, working for the UN for the world, uh, doing a World Bank project, and been since then all over the world. I've been working most recently, at the moment, I'm just a consult consulting as an independent consultant, but most recently I was working for a wonderful organization called the International Pole and Line Foundation. And I think that's probably, that role is where I got the most insights into the politics and all the nitty gritty of what's going on behind the scenes when we talk about tuna fisheries management. So yeah, I would hope that I can give you some interesting insights into what's been going on in that space. And there's lots to cover, so let me just dive straight in. I'm going to focus on the, the Indian Ocean. It's kind of, at the moment, the last couple of years, it's definitely been the most spicy area. There's been the most politics and a lot of um, issues going on in, in this region. For context, if you look at the, the top left map, the blue area is what we call the area of competence of what's called the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. So we have to manage these highly migratory stocks as a, as a ocean-wide unit. They travel, they don't care about our national boundaries on maps. So this Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, it's like a UN body. It actually falls under the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the one in the Indian Ocean does. And it's where it, the different government delegations get around the table and negotiate how they're going to manage, sustainably manage these tuna fisheries and hopefully equitably too. Um, unfortunately, the Indian Ocean has the worst stock conditions for the key tuna species of any other region globally. And the yellowfin tuna has been particularly controversial. It's been over, overfished since 2015, and we haven't managed to turn that around. And you'll get some insights into why during this talk. Um, very diverse, you know, local and foreign fleet stakeholders fishing in this region. And of all of the tropical oceans, it's the region with the highest proportion of ocean-wide catch that's taken by small-scale artisanal fishermen. And to me, that speaks to how important these stocks are to direct nutrition and livelihoods of coastal communities in the Indian Ocean. And you can see a lot of developing coastal states bordering this, this region. And there's a huge diversity of cultures, religions, and ambitions to develop or maintain tuna fisheries in this region. I think an important starting point here is we've got also the very large fleets that are focused on exporting the products that they catch. And for example, the European Union owns these purse seine vessels, the one that you see in the middle, the very large vessels. They, the ones owned by the EU caught one third of all of the tropical tuna catch throughout the whole Indian Ocean in 2021. And that's that's an increase of 40% since 2015 when the when the yellowfin tuna was first considered overfished and in a bad state. So it's important to consider you've got these much larger fleets fishing for the same shared stock as much smaller fisheries that are just trying to feed themselves. And that vessel in the, on the, in the middle, they're using helicopters to find fish. They're using all sorts of other technologies they're setting a net that can be two kilometers long and 200 meters deep. And it's called a purse seine because they set the net around the school of fish. And then like a purse, they close the bottom and then they take everything that's in the net. And to be fair, I think the photograph underneath is not actually tuna. It's probably mackerel or some other smaller pelagic, but it gives you an indication of the kind of scale of harvest that these fleets can achieve with a single set of their net. Now, if you look in the top right, I think a lot of you would be aware of, of um, longline fisheries and the bad thing about longline fisheries in, in in general is that they're using squid and fish as bait so pretty much everything in the ocean eats a fit a fit another fish or a squid so pretty much anything that eats those is just as likely to also eat one with a hook in it so huge bycatch issues catching sharks turtles all sorts of endangered species alongside the and unfortunately the the long are also by far the worst when it comes to slavery and um, social issues, labor abuse and all the rest of it. And I think most people are surprised to hear one of those vessels can spend over a year at sea on what they'd call a single fishing trip. They get supplied and other vessels take their fish away. They stay 200 miles offshore so that they're beyond any national jurisdiction of a government. And it's happening on a day, every day. It's happening right now. There's lots of modern slaves still on boats. 
I want to take this opportunity to kind of highlight fisheries management in principle and the theory of it is not complicated. Ultimately, you know, you'd, you don't want to kill the fish faster than the stock reproduces itself. Let the population stay healthy. You don't want to kill baby fish. You want to give them at least one chance to reproduce before you harvest them so they can contribute to the next generation before being taken out of the system. And of course, you don't want to ruin the ecosystem within which you're fishing. So, you know, the fish need a habitat to live in as well. So in theory, it's not very complicated. Um, in practice, much more complicated. For example, those large per seine fleets catching a third of all the catch, they want small yellowfin tuna. When it comes to yellowfin and big eye tuna, they want the small ones actually juveniles because they fit more conveniently into the cannery infrastructure. So they're actually actively avoiding catching adults, which brings with it its own problems. I think each juvenile fish that's taken is a potential future spawner. So and you, in that process, you also have to kill many more fish. If you need 100 kilograms of fish, you can kill, a, kill 100 kilo fish, or you can kill 101 kilo baby fish. And that all has implications along the way. Ultimately, there's lots of politics and industry lobbying going on. And that's the hard part. We manage people, we don't manage fish. So we must keep that in mind. In the top right, I've got a quality mixed in there. That's another layer of complication that we're working really hard on. You know, ultimately we need to break the mold of rich developed nations that are hugely subsidizing their fleets, taking the biggest, biggest piece of the catch and making the most profit while everyone else, including the coastal states that actually border the region are suffering. So how do we actually manage fisheries? There's a whole list. There's a big toolbox available to fisheries managers. And you know they each have their pros and cons and work differently in, in different circumstances. But I'll highlight some of the key bits and the kind of framing or the, the, you know, the, the categories that we can put them into. Um, first up, we've got what we call output controls. There you're trying to manage how much is getting taken out of the system. You're, you're generally trying to limit the catch to within a sustainable limit, you're typically targeting a maximum sustainable yield or a max maximum economic yield. Typically, then you would close the fishery when the guys have, when the fleets have caught the, you know, they've, they've reached the target, then the fishery would typically be closed. Anyone who exceeds the limits would then have consequences for doing so, probably in the next season, maybe get less fish or have direct fines. The alternative kind of methodology of structuring is input controls. These are, we consider them, I consider them like much more a preventative measure. You're limiting the capacity of the fleets to do damage to the fish stocks. How many boats are there? How big are they? Are they using destructive fishing methods? This can be, I believe, a much more practical means of managing fisheries. You know, you're, you're preventatively limiting their risk of, of causing damage rather than trying to manage them in real time and close them once they reach a certain point. So just different ways of managing, but there are plenty options. Just to give a little bit more context before we dive into the kind of the story behind what's been going on, you know, each country will submit data to that Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. The scientists there will do the number crunching to see not only the, the condition of the stocks, but they'll also define a total allowable catch for the whole ocean for each key species. So that's the pie that we have to play with. That's the total amount. Thereafter, country delegations are negotiating between each other how to cut that pie up. You know, the pie, the limit of the size of the pie has already been defined by the scientists. Now everyone's trying to work out who gets the biggest piece of the pie. A, a frustration I see, and it's, I'm not alone in it, is we have large developed countries. They've got huge fleets. They've been using excessively destructive fishing gears and hugely subsidizing the operations of their fleets for, for, for many years now. But their argument is they built an industry off a large quota. So they deserve to maintain the largest piece of the quota into the future. Otherwise, you know, they're going to lose jobs and their industry doesn't have the fish to supply it. Their claims of what they call historical catch don't actually have seem to have a real legal backing, though. They're just accepted and being increasingly challenged. These are these large fleets are the largest drivers of historical and current overfishing. In essence, they've already proven that they can't be trusted to put the resource first. So we should not keep um, repeating this cycle, especially when it comes to foreign fleets that have you know, much less incentive to look after stocks than they would if they were in their local waters. All right, that's kind of the context piece. 
uh, within the title, we have science. So this I'm going to try and explain in the simplest terms I possibly can. These are outputs from the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission scientists. It's important to understand a overfished stock is a stock that has been harvested too much. So the the stock is below a level that could provide a maximum sustainable yield. You've, you've taken too many fish out of that stock. Overfishing is the process of catching fish faster than they reproduce. So if you overfish a stock for too long, it will end up being overfished. That's important to understand here when we look, for example, at the top for big eye tuna. There's a 79, if you look in the red on the top there, 79% likelihood that the big eye tuna is both overfished, so the stock is, is depleted, and overfishing is continuing. So we're continuing to kill them faster than they reproduce, so the stock will still be continuing to decline. So there's a 79% likelihood of that. We only have 25% of the spawner stock biomass left from what it used to be. So we're playing with a quarter of the stock left behind, and we're still hammering them. You know, we're kicking them while they're down. If we look at yellowfin tuna, which is another important stock, bearing in mind big eye and yellowfin are the species that you're going to be having in sushi, 68% um, chance of being in the same disastrous condition. Overfish stock, continuing to kill them faster than they reproduce. And the yellowfin's been a hot topic because it's been the case since 2015. Um, skipjack tuna, they're the ones that you're typically seeing in a can. They're the... They're the they're the bulk product for a cannery. So your can, can tuna products will have a mix of yellowfin and big eye, and we'll, you'll understand why just now. But the skipjack is kind of the core target for canneries. Um, it's a miracle fish. Somehow, still in 70% likelihood of being in the green, although we keep exceeding the, the, the catch limits to, uh, defined by scientists through the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. So we're living on board time with skipjack, and it's only a matter of time if we keep behaving that as we have been, that the skipjack tuna stock's also going to be in the red and in decline. It's important to understand, you know, we're out there with a focus on tuna fisheries. It's one of the most valuable industries in, on the planet. You know, I think people often underestimate how valuable tuna fishing really is. Fishing is a huge industry and, you know, going behind oil, oil and gas and mining, I think fisheries is, is third in line. So it's a huge industry, a lot of money, and a lot of, a lot of extraction going on at the end of the day. If we look at the graph on the top left, this is for blue marlin. Some of you will be familiar with blue marlin. Beautiful fish, amazing fish, very popular in sport fisheries, and hugely valuable in sports fisheries as well, especially when they tag and release them, and someone will pay a hell of a lot of money to go and catch and release another one another day, or the same fish another day. If you look in the top left graph, this is a, it's a scaled catch rate, but you use your catch rate as an indicator of abundance. You know, if you put 100 hooks in the water for X amount of time and fish are swimming around randomly, then you would catch 50 fish back in the day. Maybe you only catch one or two today. And it's simply, a, a, it's an indicator of abundance. So back in the early 1950s, when the Japanese first started longlining, you can see that their catch rate was way up at 14. You go all the way down to 2010. So we're still worse. We're probably worse than where we were then. It's hardly even visible on the scale. And this is important so we understand shifting baselines. This is happening across generations. And ultimately, what I'm trying to say, a great day's fishing today would have been a pretty crap day out in the 1950s, even though those boats had much less technology and information to go and catch these fish with. You would have, many of you probably would have noticed the dolphins in there. Everyone loves dolphins. Unfortunately, in the Indian Ocean, it seems like 80% of those have been killed by commercial fishing. I will highlight here that this isn't necessarily something pointing to industrial fleets completely. Gillnet fisheries seem to be the main issue there. And unfortunately, they tend to be the hardest to manage or, or adjust because they're typically seen as an employer of last resort and a nutrition fishery more than an export focused high quality product type of fishery. So that you don't have the same sort of market incentives to try and adjust what they do. So a little bit more context. I'm sorry if I'm bombarding you all and there's there's quite a lot to cover, but hopefully, you know, everyone's everyone's keeping up and stop me if 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 anything gets out of hand. But ultimately, fishermen have known forever that fish swimming out in the open water in the middle of the deep blue, it's kind of a it's a blue desert out there. There's not a hell of a lot going on. So when you have any floating structure, so historically and still today, 
you'd have a log these days more and more a piece of plastic or or something floating in the ocean the algae will grow on it crustaceans will hang on it small fish will hide around it bigger fish come to eat the small fish so you end up with like a, a an ecosystem around a floating object in the sea so forever fishermen have known that's a good thing go and fish around floating objects that you see and you'll catch more of these open water fish that we call pelagic fish now they started to design their their own pads over time like purpose-built structures to to make take advantage of this and i'd like to kind of emphasize that i think all fish aggregated uh, aggregating devices are, are are bad in a way We've seen how badly the stocks have declined, and this is a plaster on a gaping wound that is overfishing. Ultimately, we're aggregating the fish that are left to make them easier and more consistent to catch, not dealing with the core issue, which is that we've already taken too many out and the stocks are damaged. So it's a plaster issue. It's got a short lifespan, and if you ask me. Um, but anyway, these anchored fads are typically deployed pretty close to shore within reach to within reach of coastal communities and you know they tend to serve a you know more of a livelihood and nutrition um, purpose in that respect for example in the Maldives there's there's 50 anchored fads managed by the government to support the fisheries there and enable consistent catch rates now we'll look at the these okay these are anchored again to the bottom and they're stationary and they they can be maintained now we'll look at the big brother of the, the anchored fad. And these are really the sticking point of fisheries management and fisheries sustainability in the Indian Ocean, and I'd say globally at the moment for tuna fisheries. So if you look in the top left, we've got a diagram there. So what we have, we've got a floating structure on the surface, and then underneath it will be a long, what they call a tail, a structure of often netting or ropes and other materials like that, uh, shade cloth, stuff like that. And then you'll see in the left, there's an orange, um, an orange boy talking to a satellite. That orange boy, what that actually looks like is the image on the top right hand side. Each of those round things is a satellite boy. So those are like a fish finder that you get on, on a boat. They're telling the, the industry on, on shore and the vessels at sea in near real time where they are and what sort of fish are aggregated underneath the fish aggregating device that they're attached to. So in essence, we, we've gone from, they're not, these, these vessels are no longer fishing. They might as well be playing computer games and you, in future, you might not even need to have people on the boats because they know where they're going. They go straight and they, they, they plot the most cost-effective route between the fads that they're tracking to hoover up as much fish as possible, ultimately. Now, although they have near real-time tracking of, of these devices, thanks to the boys that are attached to each one, in the Western Pacific, we're looking at up potentially over 90% of these devices are lost slash abandoned after they drift beyond, you know, once they drift out of the fishing area, I think generally that the, the satellite communications is turned off, so it doesn't cost them anything more. And, you know, less than 10%, it can be as bad as less than 10% are actually ever recollected and, and dealt with properly. So the rest are abandoned at sea and causing pollution. And what you see here is ghost fishing. So the netting, you've got endangered turtles there in the middle of the top. Then you've got some silky sharks tangled in the netting. You can see the floating structure at the top. And then in the bottom left, that's actually a porpoise that's captured in one of those, I think, from the Pacific. So the netting attached to these is entangling all sorts of animals. Imagine a dead turtle attracts a shark, and then the shark gets entangled, which attracts another shark or other predators. So it's a cycle of just wasteful mortality. And of course, there's pollution. Unfortunately, the coastal states are ending up being the ones cleaning up the mess left behind by the industrial Persane fleets that are the only ones deploying these drifting fish aggregating devices and majority owned by the European Union. Um, they also cause an increase in, um, in bycatch in general when they set the net around these devices. There's a lot of other species that also aggregate around them. And um, yeah, essentially they're an ecological disaster. Don't believe the hype. They have not really improved over time despite a lot of industry media suggestions that they have. And you'll see some evidence to that effect just now. One key point to remember on the last point, on uh, one of the last points on this slide, sorry, 
is 97% of the overfished yellowfin tuna caught around drifting pads are juveniles, closer to 100% are of big eye tuna are juveniles, because adult big eye tuna tend to leave, live at depth. You wonder why this is happening. This seems like a ridiculous, illogical thing to do. If you look in the bottom right graph, the red line is the catch from first same fisheries. So it's kind of the late 1970s is when they started to kind of purpose built and deploy drifting fads in huge numbers. And you can just see that their catch rate has skyrocketed. Every All the other types of fishing gears have remained relatively stable. So it's popular because it's hugely lucrative and increases the productivity of the of this fishery. Of course, that doesn't mean the productivity of the tuna stocks can keep up. Another thing to make very clear, drifting fads are now everywhere. You know, in the in the top left uh, map, the the green lines are tracks of fads. Um, I think it was just yeah, three from three fishing vessels over six months. So you see the sort of coverage that's that's happening with these drifting fads drifting all over the ocean. On the right hand side, you'll see a similar map. In the bottom left is actually the top end of the no northern territory of Australia. You got Papua New Guinea there. That is a year in that region of the regional management authority tracking fads, all the gray lines. So it's kind of all scribbled in, they're all over the place there. If you look at the bottom map, you can recognize Africa there. So you've got the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean on the right, and then the Indian Ocean on the right-hand side. All of the gray bits are where fads have been tracked and or seen, and all the darker gray is the key fishing areas where there's a higher density of them and more observers actually seeing these. So, you know, they're unavoidable. They're all over the place. I think in the Indian Ocean, at the moment, each vessel can deploy about 250. And bear in mind for the anchored fads, Maldives as a big, big tuna fishing nation has 50 throughout its whole archipelago managed by the government. So 250 for each persona, while countries have 50 or less usually. So what do we do? How do we manage fads? And what's the incentive to do so? Um, that study on the bottom left, actually, the Western Central Pacific region, that study suggests that that region loses about 180 million US dollars per year through the use of fads. So that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense that you're losing money in the process, but there's just too much greed and efficiency and convenience of using fads. The reason they're losing money is because they're, they're catching these baby fish before they can grow and provide a more nutrition by just catching bigger fish and reproducing the stock by catching them when they're actually adults. So it's a, it's come down to sort of greed and commercial convenience, even at an overall loss to, to the region. So there's good incentive to try and deal with this issue. You know? In every other region except the Indian Ocean, so all other tropical oceans have what's called a fad closure for at least 70 day, 72 days of the year across the whole ocean. And during that period, per seine fisheries cannot uh, deploy, maintain, or fish around their, their drifting fish aggregating devices. These are in all other oceans. They, you know, all other oceans, tuna stocks are in a healthier condition. I don't think that that's a coincidence when you consider the cost of catching so many millions of juvenile fish. And um, in, in the other areas, it's not only a 72-day 72, 72 day closure, there's generally regulations before and after and or extensions in specific nurse, nursery areas to protect those juvenile fish for even, even longer. So you're looking at about three months of the year closures is, is sort of pretty standard these days, except in the Indian Ocean. It's been a huge cause of contention. EU scientists themselves have even shown that a DFAD closure in the first quarter of the year in the Indian Ocean would have all of the key tuna stocks that I showed you, those three, in the green quadrant, so healthy and recovered by 2030. So there's science from the EU themselves backing this at the moment. Other ways of managing that are, some of them are in place in the Indian Ocean and elsewhere already. You can limit how many uh, of these buoys are active at, at any one time. But you, know, you wanna really manage, you wanna really um, control how many fads are being deployed in the first place. But there's nice convenient legal wording limiting only how many buoys the fleets can follow at any one time. So that means they can actually have more fads in the water and turn on and off their satellite communications to only track, say, 250 at any one time, 
while still having more damage. So that's a, something we're trying to weed out of the out of the, the management framework at the moment. There are limits on how many buoys each vessel can purchase. So that can kind of limit the, that's sort of an input control, although it seems quite a lot higher than it needs to be. So there's wiggle room in that. Some places have tried to limit how many times you can, how many net sets can be done around fads, although, you know, that just adds other layers of complexity. So it's very hard to manage, monitor and manage. Um, from a structural percent uh, point of view, then we see bands on having any netting on the fads and other mesh materials that like even um, shade cloth rots over time, a turtle puts its head through the hole and then gets tangled in those as well. So managing the structural components of the fads is also important and requiring biodegradable materials to mitigate the pollution impacts. Although I would say there are very convenient categories, too many of them on biodegradability levels now. So it's a very slow stepwise approach and the industry gets a nice tap on the back for taking microscopic steps in the right direction. Anyway, the main determination to avoid having these same rules within the Indian Ocean, even though the EU's agreed to the same in all other tropical oceans already seems to be over 70% of tuna going to EU markets that's actually caught by EU boats is harvested in the Indian Ocean. So ultimately, there's a drive to maintain the Indian Ocean as the last playground. I want to emphasize that these fad management and complementary measures do work. There are many regions with, with um, you know, other regions do have healthy fish stocks and everything's going well for them. They're implementing these, these sort of measures properly. And in the Atlantic in 2019, we, there was a great victory where a fad closure was implemented along with supporting measures within the big eye tuna stock uh, um, rebuilding plan. So the very next stock assessment, I believe, was two years later. It already showed that overfishing had stopped. So we'd stopped killing the fish faster than they reproduce and gave a glimpse of hope for recovery of the stock to the level that would supply maximum sustainable yield. Uh, unfortunately, not surprisingly, the delegations or the countries with per se interests, as soon as that, in, that news came out, the first port of call was to provide a false olive, olive branch to the West African coastal states, essentially saying, let's increase the total allowable catch. So let's enable everyone to catch more fish and the excess that we add on top will give to the West Africans who want a bigger piece of this pie. Of course, that helped them avoid reductions in their own catches that their, their own fleets, the EU fleets were allowed to make uh, in the process and would have had implications on reducing the rate at which the stocks could recover. So not really a, a nice favor being done there. But overall, that hasn't gone through properly. Principles are generally now being defended by themselves. So once these rules are in place, they're pretty hard to get rid of. It's also an important thing. Um, here, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's often a contentious issue, and I'll be interested to hear comments from, from others and questions from others at the end of the presentation. Um, you know, what we end up with, as the title states here, facts on the word, water versus prof profitable fiction. In the bottom left, we've got a drifting fish aggregating device, loads of plastic and junk and metal and rubbish that we collected from a marine protected area here in, in Watamu, Kenya. Um, now, drifting fad products are being certified by the Marine Stewardship Council, which is generally seen as the, the label. You know, it's the sustainability label with the most traction, I would say. Unfortunately, you know, they used to say only one by one fishing methods like pole and line, catching fish one at a time and employing more people per unit harvest. Only those were the sustainable option. Then it kind of, their measures got a bit diluted to say, okay, fad free. If you're not fishing around fads, you're the sustainable choice. Now they're going and certifying fad caught per se products. Now, this shouldn't really come as a surprise considering as, as you see in the bottom right, they, they ended up certifying Costa Rican per se fleets that set, they systematically set their nets around uh, pods of dolphins because they know dolphins, the tuna typically hang out under the dolphins. So those poor pods of dolphins were consistently getting harassed and having a net set around them. Everyone wants the tuna underneath, shoo them out the top of the net, take the rest. 
anyway, it got sustainably certified and got the blue tick so it could charge a premium and look good to consumers. Um, yeah, so fad free is becoming a thing of the past. And unfortunately, there's a lot of narrative, including from NGOs, that MSC and these sort of certifications are the way to go. If you're as cynical as me, unfortunately, you see it as retailers are ultimately outsourcing their due diligence. And there's so much of dilution of ambition happening within these certifications. And I think the main driver there, which is easy enough to understand, is the Marine Stewardship Council gets paid for every can of tuna sold with their logo on it. So over time, your incentive is, of course, increase the volumes of MSC certified tuna, increase your revenue. They have millions of pounds in the bank already, which has caused concern and as an NGO and a conservation group. But um, this, is, this is what's driving it. As usual, follow the money. Talking of money, we've got huge subsidies and power dynamics that link to you know, financial components of, of, of different countries and where they stand in the global hierarchy. This uh, diagram on the left is a little bit complicated. I really like it, but <laughs> it's a bit complicated to understand if you don't have full context. But essentially, look on the left-hand side. That's a list of vessels. okay? And then the dark colored lines are, are vessels that are flagged to Mauritius. The lighter blue or green are vessels that are flagged to Seychelles. Every vessel has to fly the flag of a country within these, within these areas. In essence, that country is supposed to be held responsible for what those vessels do at sea. Although the Seychelles and Mauritius are not all that, you know, understandably so, these countries are not uh, super keen to go and impose restrictions or highlight non-compliance within fisheries they're supposed to be responsible for. Follow this diagram to the right-hand side, you realize it goes from being flagged to these countries who proudly claim that they have a per saint fleet to then nominal owners all, all over the place and then actual beneficial owners, the people that are making money from the catches and the profitability of these fish going to companies that all sit in France and Spain. So all roads lead to France and Spain yet again here. And even though Mauritius and Seychelles should be responsible for what those fleets are doing, those vessels are doing, that's a very convenient blurring of the lines. So keep that in mind again for EU, um, very determined to maintain the status quo. There's also huge subsidization of tuna fisheries. Many longline fleets just wouldn't financially exist unless they were subsidized these days because there's just not the fish to support their operations anymore. But they receive massive subsidies. And here in this figure, we're talking about 28 billion euros worth of annual fishing subsidies. Of course, it's very hard if you're a small scale fisherman in a little boat using more responsible gears, not catching tons and tons a day to compete, not only on economies of scale, but also to compete with these huge vessels when you as a small scale fisherman actually have to pay for the boat you fish on and you have to pay for the fuel you use, even when you have a crap day's fishing. So important to recognize how that gives an unfair advantage. In the bottom right, you've got the map that shows it's the size of the delegations representing each country at the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission meetings. You'll see, you know, most of the developing coastal states around the edge of the region, you know, one to five delegates typically. The European Union, 40 delegates, and I believe even more. And that's been growing rapidly in recent years. If you have a look there, Iran has two, Pakistan has a single delegate generally represented. So it's it's David and Goliath in the negotiation room as well. And that 40 strong group from the European Union will be legal experts, lawyers, um, fishery scientists and uh, politicians, as well as uh, industry lobbyists that are helping influence things to maximize their ca catch opportunities. And it's worth noting some of the subsidies that countries are giving are, you know, these developed state countries are giving some subsidies in excess of whole countries gross domestic products. So it's it's a huge amount of money going into there. And I got into, it. <laughs> there was an interesting, I think it was last year, where I was helping a delegate from Pakistan for whom English is not his first language. He was trying to, um, let's say, question or counter a statement that was misleading, that was made by the European Union. And it was him by himself against the 40 strong delegation. So I he asked me to help with, I, I provided some, some wording to him. 
as he's not a first language English speaker. But we had a, a delegate from the Seychelles take a photograph of his computer screen at the time and then kick up a big stink and say, we were playing dirty tricks. But I'm sure most of you would agree, helping a single man um, speak outside of his main, his main language was not a bad thing to do, especially with what's on the line for people in Pakistan if these stocks continue to decline. Okay, uh, we're nearly we're getting towards the end. Sorry, there's so much information here. I've tried to distill it. Essentially, we had a we had a meeting. Everything came to a point in Mombasa, Kenya, uh, last year February. Um, we we weren't make there was not enough progress being made on fad management, and it was convenient for the Persane industry to keep kicking the can down the road, discuss other topics at length. So we never really get to the nitty gritty of improving the management of fads. So there was a special session held in Mombasa. There was a, a, a measure to improve the management of anchored fads that was submitted and it was rapidly endorsed by consensus. Everyone, including the coastal states that are typically deploying and using these, happy to improve the management. Resolution 2302 was a resolution to improve the management of drifting fads and it became a hugely contentious issue. It was submitted by Kenya and the Kenya Fisheries Ministry used to be very vocal against drifting fads and the impacts they're having on the, you know, the livelihoods of, of, of coastal communities. Submitted by Kenya with 11 other countries co-sponsoring. But during the opening statement of the meeting, this guy on the left, Mr. Salim Buria, the cabinet secretary of the Blue Economy for Kenya, stole the show by closing his opening statement saying, by the way, Kenya withdraws um, that submission. So that conservation measure proposal. I find it, it doesn't mean anything, but I find it interesting that the first person follow, such displayed following him on Twitter is Dr. Julio Moron, and he is kind of the head honcho of uh, the Spanish Persane industry. We had a hundred, organ before this meeting, we had a hundred organizations pushing for improved management. And thereafter, you can see all of these um, articles and statements uh, challenging what happened essentially. And luckily we had Indonesia resubmit the proposal with the other 10 countries, just leave Kenya's name off the list. We pushed it, it was pushed to a vote and if, which is very rare. Everyone's trying to seek consensus. Went to a vote, two thirds of IOTC members essentially endorsed that new measure to have these new rules put in place. Now, unfortunately, to add another layer of compl complication, there's 120 days after such a vote in which one third of members need to object to the new rules before within that 120 days and then it's a non-binding measure it kind of the whole thing falls flat so the eu did a very good job within the 120 days and managed to get one third of members to object including two objections from themselves that we'll talk about just now somalia there was an objection from a from a person that wasn't a delegate in the room and then that actually got withdrawn by people that were actually in the negotiating room so interesting things going on behind the scenes all over the place um, further negotiations happening in may essentially the objections keep in mind the the european union has two objections largely because france benefits from having an additional seat at iotc because of ils de passes i probably butchered that pronunciation, but it's a, a few small uninhabited islands in the Mozambique Channel, which they, they leverage within these places, within these negotiations to say they're very concerned coastal state themselves. Um, essentially, Bloom Foundation, Bloom is a great NGO, and they've worked together with Blue Marine Foundation, who submitted some information towards this, I believe. Um, two, two appeals have been filed uh, against the EU's objections to those new rules because they believe that they contradict the EU's own common policy fisheries law. So, you know, they reckon that the European Commission chose to align with the interests of a handful of French and Spanish companies, and they broke their own law in the process. We'll see. But if that, if those uh, legal challenges come to fruition, then in theory, the EU would withdraw its objections and those regulations might still come into play. I want to just wind up. Uh, burning questions, at least from my side, what's next? Um, the next annual session for the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission is happening in Bangkok in May. I hope to be there and keep fighting the good fight. We will see. Um, those legal actions, like I said, might bring that resolution back into play, although I would suspect multiple 
uh, new submissions coming to the new annual session to try and improve management, regardless of what's happening or ends up happening to that resolution that caused so much contention with the vote. Um, yeah, we need to continue coordinating with the developing coastal states. There's a group called the G16, which works in that in that space, helping coastal states in their capacity and their negotiating power, and also push back against slander. I've had, I think it was last week, one of the uh, EU fisheries media agencies inventing out of thin air some parent quotes from me that I would never have said to try and stir the pot a bit in advance of the upcoming meeting. So we'll deal with all those sort of things. Um, of course, at the end of the day, we want to rebuild the stocks as sustainably and equitably as possible. What can you do as a consumer or a concerned citizen? I'd say, you know, general <laughs> rule of thumb at the moment, uh, I'd say don't buy per se court canned tuna. It'll say so on the can usually, sane court or per se court. They all use drifting fares. They're all having the sort of impacts that we've that I've shown you, not only on juvenile of tuna stocks, but bycatch of other species and all the ecosystem impacts. Unfortunately, you can't blindly trust certifications such as the Marine Stewardship Council. Many of those seem to do more harm than good, and retailers shouldn't be so easily let off the hook for just um, outsourcing their due diligence to support, you know, sustainable and responsible procurement of seafood. Um, support handline or rod and line court tuna instead of long line court wherever you can. And you can have a look at the IPLF sourcing transparency platform to look for, you know, good sources. Um, if someone's selling you seafood can't tell you what that fish is, it's almost guaranteed to be bad stuff. So if they can't and, it, and they're not clear on the source, I would suggest try not to buy that, that sort of seafood product. Support local fishermen using responsible fishing gears whenever you can. We, I advocate for one by one fishing methods, essentially catching fish one at a time with with one hook and one line. Um, they're you know naturally limiting and employ many more people and can provide the highest quality products if the if the fish are looked after after being caught immediately. Spread awareness among your friends and colleagues about how complicated this all is, and do vote with your wallet. Some people say to me, oh, "I'm just going to stop eating fish." That's like saying you don't like the president, so you're just going to not vote. You lose your say. And if you don't engage and support good fisheries, the big bad guys organically win. They're highly subsidized and huge economies of scale in their favor. Do give politicians credit where it's due and hold all the other, others firmly accountable. I know quite a few of you are in South Africa, and you can be proud how firm and active some of the South African delegates have been in these negotiations really helping the other coastal states and pushing for conservation and accountability. So they do deserve credit. Um, don't give up. Don't be cynical. I know I need to get out of this game before I become a cynical old man. There is hope. There are options. We've had some amazing wins so far to date, and there's still much more to do. And that is it. Thank you very much and open for questions. Absolutely fascinating, if a little bit terrifying, as <laughs> you said it there at the end with the, with the hope part. Um, but it's really clear to see how passionate you are about trying to overturn these issues, which is fantastic. So thank you for that. Um, we've had a few questions coming in in the chat during your talk. So I will start with a question from Marty Jasper. For the um, the fads, um, is there any way that the owners of devices could be forced to pay a hefty deposit and then only once they return and confirm that they aren't out at sea anymore would they be able to get their deposit back sure so yeah, like i can't hear you particularly well i'm not sure why but i've, I've got that one um ipnlf has been pushing to have a polluter praise principle which would sort of play that role you know you're responsible for that device when you put it in the water and if you don't go and pick it up you pay a, a, a hefty you know, reasonable fine or consequence for, for not recovering these devices. You can only imagine if a, you know, a tourism cruise liner was caught dumping something like this overboard with no real plan to collect it. They'd, they'd be shut out of business, but it's happening hourly around the world by persainers. Um, the non-compliance that we've seen, we've picked up, well, colleagues of mine have picked up over 200 drifting fads in, in the Indian Ocean coastal states so far. Not a single one has been fully compliant with the regulations that we that were put into place in 2019. So they've had plenty of time to start complying. Not a single one compliant. And one of the main things there is not labeling 
the the boys they they scribble all sorts of other stuff like the the serial number and everything else onto those boys for themselves but they don't put their names and sort of acronyms on them which is part of the rules they should be there should be accountability there's also a push to have a public fad register so if you pick one of these boys up you can say hey you know spanish boat x come pick your fad up but that's part of dodging accountability that's happening so i agree in principle we're trying but it's tricky Oh, okay, thank you. It does seem like that public um, public sort of website would be a really great idea to hold accountability. But as you say, you've just got to keep pushing those kind of things through. Um, we've got another question in the chat from Eric from Kenya. Um, he says, great presentation, Roy. I believe market states can play a huge role in conservation of tuna by not accepting imports of juvenile tuna and having strong traceability schemes. Um, do you know if there are such systems, especially in the countries that import huge quantities of tuna um, and then he also asked if there are any currently any seasonal closures of gear restrictions for vessels vessels fishing tuna in Indian Ocean which I think you mentioned a little bit about the fads and then a third question which is how strong are the current sanction systems in deterrence of IUU fishing so Eric seems to know quite a lot about fishing I think more than me <laughs> uh, yeah let me just get uh, sanctions yeah okay um the market one is a tricky one to answer um because you know i've done quite a lot of work with with markets you know retailers and you know people along the supply chain in the at, like for those of you in south africa woolworth does a great job and they stick to their principles they're all their own brand product is poland line caught from the maldives they don't take anything from long lines or persane for their own brand canned product um there's been an increasing drive from NGOs in particular to say the markets can cut through all this bureaucracy and politics. You know, they're the buyers at the end of the day. They can they can change the mold. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, markets are not there. You know, seafood sales companies are not there to save the world. They're there to make profits. And they're sort of tied in a race to the bottom that ultimately falls to what's the cheapest product so they can be competitive between each other. It's often the smaller retailers that can make a niche out of saying, we're going to do the right thing, even if it costs a bit more, our product's better or more responsibly procured. But this, there's been a big NGO drive that the markets will save the day. And unfortunately, it's not really panning out as many of us would hope. One more thing on that front is the, I was in the Madagascar, for example, canneries are getting built by the EU you know, with funding from the Spanish industry and all the rest of Spanish or French. So there's, these canneries get built, but there's a point of origin rule, which means fishermen in those countries can't supply it to the EU through their own EU market channels, through the canneries the EU paid to build, unless the boats are flagged to the EU. So sure, you employ some people on the shore, but you're not providing an opportunity to kind of ride that train and, and improve your your exporting opportunities and value closures in the iotc there's a funny one at the moment recently i think because of quite a lot of heat about the fad issues and the upcoming meeting mauritius has recently said they're going to have a full fishing closure for one month or two months I stand to be corrected but not practical are the artisanal fishermen fishing from the shore every day just not going to eat for two months What's the plan there? How are they going to enforce them all over the coastline? And in reality, they'll continue to feed the canneries in Mauritius with product from Seychelles and other, other vessels, you know, other ports. They'll, they'll transship product to keep the cannery running. They might well use that two months to put some more fancy tech and do some maintenance on their person vessels so they fish more efficiently the rest of the year. So cynical, but <laughs> from a closures perspective, that's the only closure currently in the Indian Ocean. There used to be another one for during the piracy period, but let me not get too tied up. Sanctions wise, I think it's three years in a row with increasing numbers. We've submitted to the IOTC Compliance Committee these figures and photographs and evidence that these um, we keep picking up these drifting fads and not a single one compliant to date. Nothing's happened yet. You know, it all goes down to, at the end of the day, I used to get really frustrated about it and thinking these RFMOs as UN-style bodies, they should have some clout and some teeth. 
But the reality is they provide a platform for countries to make decisions and discuss and negotiate, and they provide information. They're not there to, to drive the narrative. So it's pretty tricky. You know, they're not the police per se. The governments need to decide we need to deal with these issues and actually move on it. So sanctions wise, really it's, it's more political embarrassment is the bigger driver than financial fines. And you're not, you're not getting these boats. You'll get put on an IUU list, which is, you know, socially awkward for a while, but it's, it's not as effective as it should be. Sure. Thank you for that explanation. Um, another question here from Nina Bolu. Um, thanks, Roy. Do you think current consumer pressure needs to be stronger to reduce demand for tuna and ultimately reduce the drive from big industry to fish the region so intensively to supply these big markets? I know that you mentioned a little bit about that in um, what you should do, but she's, uh, Nina Oscar asks, what role do you think we have as scientists to raise awareness about eating fish from questionable sources? Cool. Yeah, the, I touched on it. I'm sure many of you probably saw that uh, Netflix show, Seaspiracy, and it was very impactful. I think it was great for the cause of our small scale fisheries. And I wish instead of saying don't eat fish and chasing a vegan narrative, they just said support the good guys. You know, they did. They, they tangled up some NGO representatives saying what I'm saying, which is essentially support the good guys, support the smaller fleets, as long as they're using responsible fishing methods. If you just reduce consumption, the big guys win. They're subsidized. They have the cheapest product. You don't influence the market. It's like saying, I'm not going to vote because I don't like my current government. You know, you have to maintain your influence to really have any change. Um, and awareness wise, from a scientific perspective, I think you know, this should be more in, in schools and universities. I studied fishery science. So of course, I'm biased, but like it, these sort of people should be much more aware of where their food comes from and how it gets to their plate. And um, as scientists, we can continue doing good science. Um, it's really unfortunate. A lot of the time, science does not get, you know, the science doesn't get into, you know, the, the scientists will propose X, Y, and Z, by the time the politicians have finished chewing on it and negotiating across the room, the science feels like a distance memory. So that's been depressing for me as a scientist myself, but keep doing good science and try not, you know, some, I've seen some excellent scientists get paid by industry funds and do some real damage as well. So stick to your guns, do good science, keep going. Great, thanks for the motivation. I think that's a really good way of looking at it. Um, we have another question here in the chat from Mark Lottig, and he was asking uh, what about China and Japan? And I think that was in relation to um, on your on the um, the power dynamics um, page where you were looking at the delegates from different countries in the Indian Ocean. And I think Mark would like to know a little bit more about their China and Japan's involvement in that. Oh, no, I was expecting them to come up. Um, there's a lot of sort of you know, there's a lot of narrative around Southeast well, Asian fleets taking all the fish sort of thing. And uh, sure, there's some huge fisheries in China, Taiwan, all the rest of them. You know, they do have a huge impact. Uh, my Some of my main concerns is there's a lot of long line fishing happening with, you know, Asian origins. You know, the Asian fleets are the largest in the long line sector. There's a hell of a lot of slavery and labor abuse happening on those. So you don't really want to be eating fish caught by a slave. That's where, you know, the handline fishermen operating daily from shore. It's pretty hard to keep a slave on board if you just do daily trips back and forth from the beach. Um, they do have a big impact. They've got some big fisheries. To be honest with you, China, I don't have a firm opinion based on how they interact at the at these international negotiations. You know, I haven't really come to loggerheads with, <laughs> you know, seen China be too disruptive. There are issues with shark finning that all of the sort of those Asian longline focused countries have issues with. I think it's fair to say Japan, from my personal perspective, have been an interesting one and potentially a good one in that they follow the science, they drive science. I think I believe stand to be corrected, but I believe Japan pushed through the fad closure in the Western Pacific based on saying you're catching all these baby fish before they grow, reproduce, and can then be caught by the long line fleet. So there was a bit of a commercial incentive for them too, but they 
you know, they sometimes they they don't necessarily pick sides and stay with the big guys or the little guys. They seem to be quite scientific focused. So I've been, I could say that much. Okay, great. Well, that's that's positive at least. Thank you for that. And Mark, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Um, we do have a second question in the chat from Eric. Thuranira. And Eric, I hope if you're still in the room, if you wouldn't mind maybe unmuting and asking your second question, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Roy, for the quite informative talk. Um, it's really been interesting. I've been an enthusiast of uh, fisheries and tuna stuff. So yeah, that's why I wanted, like for, for the case of, uh, I wanted to know whether there's any uh, sort of uh, ports of convenience, because I believe that uh, when a country doesn't have a strong mechanism for um, uh, you know, like uh, maybe inspecting vessels that come to offload catch at their ports. So there could be signs come some sort of, uh, yeah, sort of encouraging, you know, uh, landing of this undersized tuna that end up to the market. So I was wondering whether, do you know if there's any, you know, port of convenience that we have maybe along the way or maybe, you know, something like that. I just want to know whether there's any, maybe according to your research that you've done and the work you've done on tuna and, and uh, stuff like that. Because I believe that, uh, when I, I mean, uh, any port state which has a very strong mechanism of, um, you know, like, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, pre-arrival mechanisms, how do they make sure that this vessel that is coming to their port has been in the areas which is allowed uh, to fish? Um, and also maybe the, uh, you know, like even the issue of uh, beneficial ownerships and stuff like that. I just want to know whether there's any that, you know, thank you. Cool. Thanks, Eric. You, you clearly know some stuff about fisheries, so it's good to have <laughs> quite detailed questions there. Um, I used to work with FAO and it's ongoing, but I remember at the time there was a big push to implement the Port State Measures Agreement, essentially setting, you know, what's the minimum criteria and, you know, everyone raised the standard. So, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats sort of thing. So increase the kind of regulations at all of the ports and communication between ports. I'm not sure whether Kenya is now assigned to that. Um, there's only so much I can say, but it feels at the moment like Kenya and Tanzania are becoming ports, more convenient ports for the per se and big industry to operate out of. There's an angle towards Kenya and Tanzania. And I'd be worried if I was in Seychelles and Mauritius, they have very high operating costs and fuel costs. So it's a pretty scary time in Kenya and uh, CL, please feel free to give my number to Eric. I'll be able to <laughs> chat to him for days on these. Yeah, topics. absolutely. No, that would be really great. Okay, cool. So um, I see that um, Liesl Van Ass has put a website in the chat as well, South African Sustainable Seafood Initiative as well as a good website to follow for a guideline in South Africa. So thank you very much for that, Prof Liesl. Um, and then we have a question from um, Diane, who's actually part of the Share Screen Africa team. Um, and she asks, given the global demand for tuna and increasing pressures on marine ecosystems, how do you see the future of tuna fisheries management evolving and what role should science play in shaping policy decisions? I feel like that's um, that's quite a quite a big question. Um, what do you think, Roy? We, bearing in <laughs> mind that we are running out of time slightly. <laughs> Well, I think you answered it yourself at the end. Science needs to lead the way. And, you know, there's too much, like I say, we're managing people, not fish. These fish do what they want. We're managing how the people operate around them. The science needs to come to the forefront. The science is good. When the science is followed, there's been incredible wins and there are very sustainable fisheries in the world. So the bottom line is science is going to have to continue to, to run. Like, I often feel a bit lonely shouting at the top of my lungs and sitting in these in these negotiation rooms where there's a lot of just rubbish like talk you know what i mean it's like you know shooting fish in the head might kill them you know what i mean there's just this sort of maybe and there's potential that there's damage to the stock and it could be possible that we just need to say that's a disaster this is how we fix it and be more direct and have the science be more direct as well we have issues in these big negotiation rooms where the science is not directive enough you know provide a bit of information without a real directive and the politicians will you know have their way with it so the science needs to be clearer more descriptive more prescriptive and the science if you let the science prevail then the fisheries the fisheries will be in a good state 
Sure, that makes complete sense. And as a scientist myself, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, so, Wiki, we've got one more question here in the chat from Enrico. Um, Enrico, you are right in the middle of my screen. I wonder whether you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was very interesting, the, the parts where, Roy, you said about the discussing the misrepresentation by certain politicians politicians, even well-known scientists respected. So that is the other side of the coin that you were just talking about, about good science. Sometimes, yeah, the, the, just because a, a well-known scientist says something doesn't necessarily mean it's, well, it's good science coming out. So what is the best way to fight these misrepresentations? It's, it's, uh, in particular, where they are they're so well backed up by financial, political, uh, even scientific tenure, kind of thing. Sure, it's a it's a very good question because it's a it's a regular frustration. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I would say, yeah, you know, it, it kind of it takes years to know the characters, and then you it is unbelievable how interconnected. A lot of the it's a small space essentially it's a huge industry but there's only you know a handful of tuna expert scientists in the world and tuna management experts in the world it, it is a small small community so you know there's limited space to maneuver in that anyway but um i'd say just don't have a critical eye think about where the money comes from who's incentivized to finance such science and why has it gone a certain direction um but at the same time i think it's called accountability fish so maybe check them out there's a new organization or oh, they, they they seem to be gaining traction recently essentially they want these negotiations to be public access they want to kind of take this veil away from from all of these negotiations we are you know we're talking about the management of common pool resources you know shared tuna stocks that everyone needs to to fish and eat like it shouldn't be this veil of secrecy over these negotiations that are happening behind closed doors. So I fully support that sort of initiative to, you know, bring it to the forefront, let people see with their own eyes what's going on. Because it's bloody hard to to get the message out when you're in these closed door meetings and you know, you you are constrained in what you can say. Thank you. I fully agree. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that question, Enrico. And that is it for the questions. And I think we're just about out of time as well. Um, Joe, we've got one more comment in the chat um, from Isilda Villeurne. Very informative talk. Thank you. Also a note from our director, Johan Kruger, um, Share Screen Africa and Unlocking Nature, taking a deeper look at issues threatening the African penguin. And that's on the 25th of April. That also includes a lot about fisheries management as well. Um, so please join us there if you can. Um, one final note there from Adam and yeah, and greetings from Nigeria. Um, miss most of the talk today, but thank you so much. Um, Marty, you have got your hand up. I will let you ask one final question. Cool, thanks, Roy, um, for the chat. I was just wondering, you know, I think you may be fighting quite a difficult battle because, in many people's eyes, a yellowfin tuna is just another fish, and it doesn't have that sort of charismatic appeal of a dolphin or a whale or a something i mean are there any clever sort of marketing ploys to try and and i and i'm not saying the science is not telling them a story but like maybe try a, another angle to try and almost give it a status that you know you can't just keep on killing these things the way that the, the, that we are i mean especially the babies you know i don't know if there's an angle to say you know we mur we murdering babies <laughs> for want of a better word um, yeah. and, and they aren't even getting eaten because they're just getting trapped in those abandoned things. I mean, I, I don't know if there's another angle to try and, you know, maybe bring bring the story um, in a different way. I'm just asking. <laughs> sure. No, thanks, Marty. Uh, I'll try to be quick. Essentially, we've, we're trying those sort of things. You know, they're beautiful fish, but they're not that sexy for everyone. You know what I mean? So we're trying to make it more, more interesting, make them, you know, people care you know what i mean like how much do you really care average person they go to a shop grocery or they go to a, re a retailer they look at the tins of tuna what's the cheapest one you know what i mean there's a lot of problems in the world you've got to deal with it's it's not it's very difficult to make people care enough and understand enough you think how much we've covered just in 45 minutes here 
Um, it's important. I'll share the link, actually. It's, you've reminded me. We did a, a video series called Tuna Tales and beautiful, beautiful imagery, beautiful videos, trying to get the word out about the communities, the beautiful communities, the amazing people that critically rely on these stocks, not just for huge profits that go to their beneficiaries and their shareholders. These are people that need these fish every single day, and they're having the rug pulled out from underneath them by corporate greed. So Tuna Tales video series by IPNLF is also a, a one to watch, and I'll share the link so it can be sent to everyone. Cool. Thanks, Roy, and thanks, everyone. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Monty. I think that was a really, really nice last question to end on, and I'm definitely going to give Tuna Tales a watch, Roy, so thank you for bringing that up. Sure. Um, and... Oh, I see Marat has just shared it in the in the chat. So organized and very efficient. Thank you, Marat. Um, so that brings us to the end of our session tonight. Uh, Roy, I want to give you a massive, massive thank you for donating your time and your knowledge um, to educate us a little bit more on these issues. And I think we'll all be a bit a little bit more careful about um the fish that we're buying in the in and where they're coming from in the future. And thank you so much as well to our wonderful audience, as always, for joining. And I hope you'll all join me in unmuting yourselves and giving Roy a round of applause. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and there's so thank... a whole series of those tuna tails. That's the first one, but there's plenty. So yeah, no, oh, it's been fantastic. A... Thanks for the platform. It's great to get this news up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much again. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their evening.